What is Yado? Yado is the place where I wrote parts of three or four books. Yado is a place where I made beautiful friendships. Yado is a place that gave me fresh air in the summers and just so much joy. Yado is magic. Yado is art. Yado is community. Yado is idealism and that the world can be a better place. Yado has just been a beautiful thing for me, just glorious, a home. It's given me so much. I'm just so proud to have been connected, ever connected to it, and it's helped so many people. It's, uh, it's one of the great, beautiful places in the world. I love Yado. Yado is love. The strangers from the internet are standing outside. The strangers from the internet have come from far and wide. But I cannot receive them. I hardly believe in them. I'm Elena Richardson, the president of Yaddo and host of Shadow Yaddo, our new podcast. Thank you for tuning in. You just heard the wonderful writer Jonathan Ames give his definition of Yaddo, but maybe we need to back up. Yaddo, Yaddo, Yahoo, what? Here's the thing. Yaddo rhymes with shadow, hence the show's name. What else? It's a nonsense word, the name given to the property by a child who wanted to help her family emerge from a period of deep sadness. Apparently, she said something like, let's call it Yaddo. It will rhyme with shadow, but mean the opposite. Her parents, Spencer and Katrina Trask, embraced the idea, and one way they chased away the sorrow of enormous losses was by establishing one of the world's first artist residency programs giving their entire estate and all they had to future generations of writers and artists. From personal experience, they knew the value of retreat. And, in a not uncommon Victorian way, they also felt they knew something about the value of artists. Romantic, yeah, but also practical, it turned out. They wanted to combat income inequality, noise pollution, urbanisation, the relentless pressure of the marketplace... Yaddo was their antidote. Apparently, for many artists since 1926, the Trasks were right. Generations of artists who've lived and worked on the grounds have left testaments to the value of uninterrupted time and space, community, silence, three good meals a day. Have a listen. Yaddo is a magical estate in the woods with a beautiful old mansion and many studios and little houses scattered along paths through the woods. Your sole real responsibility is to show up every evening for dinner in the dining hall of the mansion with your fellow artists. And during the day, you can come to the mansion whenever you like to pick up your lunch, which is waiting for you in a lunchbox, like a construction worker's lunchbox, which somehow makes you always feel like you're accomplishing something, like you're a construction worker in the arts. Yado is the freedom to create. It's the freedom of time to create the kind of art that you want to do and to take risks. Yado is heaven. What Yado gifts is a personal deep dive to search and destroy, resurrect and evolve the extraordinary you. 
to help embellish what already exists by giving you something you don't necessarily know how to give yourself. Creative energy, solitude, and community. Yado is a place where you can get in touch with memories of your past and you have the time and quiet and space to begin to imagine the possibilities of a future. Yaddo, as always, as Willie Nelson might say, on my mind, this summer even more than usual. These past months of COVID disquiet came and went and come again, and I'm back in Houston where the latest hurricane could have hit but didn't, preparing to teach a seminar on Thoreau. As I tell my undergrad kiddos, Thoreau's sensibility as a writer and thinker is inseparable from both his devotion to the natural world and his convictions as an abolitionist. If these latter commitments render Thoreau all the more timely during this too long era of racial violence and eco-cataclysm, it's his vision and practice of arboreal calibration that make them possible, sustainable. I think here, which is to say I think of Yaddo, of a journal entry Thoreau writes in November 1850. I feel a little alarmed, he writes, when it happens that I have walked a mile into the woods bodily without getting there in spirit. Yaddo, for me, is where a spirit and body realign. Like Walden, Yaddo isn't removed from the world so much as adjacent to it. They give to each other so porously as to look like equilibrium, or as Thoreau would say, like deliberation, an art learned from the incessant balancing of scales. This is our pilot episode, and throughout the episode, you'll hear a sampling of music by Yaddo composers, a little taste of the rich worlds they create. There's no shortage of podcasts, clearly. So why would we do this? Why now? One reason, I suppose, is our founding narrative, which seemed especially pertinent in these fretful pandemic days. We're isolated, and there are voices within that isolation demanding to be heard. There's urgency in the moment. There's urgency in the need to feel connected and to feel we're part of something more than whatever our current bubble or pod or cohort happens to be. Yaddo's a retreat. We're a place that was consciously designed to allow for quiet, for deep thinking, reflection and solitude. But the other side of the retreat coin is community. As we all know from our own lives, whether from meditation or prayer, solitary walks or an unplugged phone, the point of retreat is to gather strength and then advance. For Yada's artists, the form that re-entry takes is a lucky one for each of us. It's the thousands of books, films, symphonies and artworks that delight, challenge and comfort us throughout the year. It turns out that Yaddo is not a collection of buildings and truly beautiful grounds. It's connection through friendships, the exchange of ideas, and the drawing together of us all. And so, with the modest hope that we can be of some use to our artists and to all of you during these fearful days, our aim in Shadow Yaddo is to broadcast stories of hope, resistance, humour and curiosity. To that end, we have a fantastic show for you today. Jonathan Lethem will share his secret to success, and we have a surprise in store, a sound art piece created by Rory Golden, the 1AM $5 toe sucker, a raw tale that captures the paradox of this moment when artists are both more revered than ever 
and also economically more vulnerable than ever. As you'll hear, these two realities, utopian and despairing, collide at 1am. But first, Christy Albano talks to the remarkable visual artist Odile Donald Odita about art and activism. heard the theater term triple threat, right? This is someone who can sing, dance, and act. Odili is a triple threat in the visual arts world. He's prolific, with three current exhibitions and several online projects out. His paintings are visually appealing, yet also intellectually muscular. They inspire action. He speaks thoughtfully and articulately about art, and he writes like a dream. Odili, welcome to Shadow Yaddo. Let's start with your reading the artist statement from Mirror, your current exhibition of new paintings. Mirror, a reflective surface that casts back a clear image. In life, the only face that you will never actually see is your own. This is the beginning of an interrelationship between figuration and abstraction. It is also a space of discourse between the notions of objectification and the imagination. Consider the process of making a self-portrait, a representation of oneself as a painting. This is the plateau of inherent disconnect. The examination of oneself as a representation is an exceedingly conceptual process. The self-portrait is in itself abstract as it objectifies the separation of self and image at its start. This genre asks a great question of how and in what ways possible can one represent the eternal qualities of black skin through paint. Willem de Kooning once said, flesh is the reason oil paint was invented. An expansive exploration of black identity in paint has allowed for an emancipation from and beyond the historical exclusivity of a type that de Kooning's statement implies. But what happens when the civil self becomes antisocial, when discourse is meant to undermine social cohesiveness, when the hand that attacks the body is only doing so to establish a new normal? Activism is at the heart of this exhibition, where agency exists in the constructive use of creativity, however imagined, to make the change needed to move one towards better and greater horizons. Mirror is an exhibition about self-reflection, With an understanding of the difficulties that this task may entail, I'm asking that we begin to look into ourselves and reflect upon the consequences of thought and actions that shape identity in the age of Trump. Much of your work takes on global challenges and inspires action and change. How do you view the intersection of art and activism? Potentially the best artist is is an activist in that they're actively engaging their world and in what they do, but also in the political sense, in the contemporary sense. Being an artist today, I think, can be very revolutionary. Some people think of it as maybe just a part of the world in the sense of you're an artist and then you become famous or you're you're an artist and we know about you, then you're famous. Or, But there's still this understanding, I think, or there's still this notion of the artist as one who questions uh, things. And I mean that in the sense of the trickster. I mean that in the sense of uh, the annoying being, the one who says, well, no, not let's, what about this way? You know, kids are amazing in that respect. They, they always, you know, some key, because kids can maybe break things. They'll take your device. They'll do all sorts of things. But in that process of, 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 of challenging what a thing does, they learn how to use it better. And so that's an action of critique, in my opinion. That's an action of investigation. So in a lot of ways, you know, they say the heart, the artist with the heart of a child, that's what they're saying when they, that's what they're meaning when they say that. The fact is you have to have that 
inquisitive ability to challenge the norm, to go beyond it, to be able to even break things, to get to a new understanding of what the thing is, and potentially to be able to use that thing better. Your installation from periphery to center connects two public spaces, Laumeyer Sculpture Park in St. Louis and Jeske Sculpture Park in Ferguson, Missouri. In 2014, Ferguson was the site of the brutal shooting of Michael Brown, an 18-year-old African-American, by a white police officer. In part, your work here references racism and police brutality, yet the image entitled X, which appears as a flag, has a sense of optimism to it, and I'm wondering how you think about optimism in your work. Uh, yeah, that's it's, that's something I think about too. Uh, I, and what I, what I mean to say, what I think about is the the optimism that might come out of these questions I ask. You know, I, I a lot of times I'm dealing with when I'm thinking about work specifically like that kind of work. I'm dealing with hard subjects and issues that really maybe annoy me, piss me off, make me upset. This is this may be an ugly thing that I'm looking at. And then I engage it in the way that I know how to engage things as a painter, the way I was taught. And that's the also the element of trying to go beyond myself. Let's say I speak as a painter, I speak as an abstract artist. I say, let me see what I can do to go beyond what I've done and what I know in the way with the language, what I know about the language I have. Let me speak about something in a way beyond my sense of self. And so that's, that's my initial pushing of myself and initial pushing of my work. Then with the color, I'm thinking about how I can address the color to, to address this subject matter. And I try, you know, I look at things, I, I research uh, artists, maybe I research uh, flags, I've researched uh, images connected to the participants in this particular story. And then I try to then have something that communicates. But I understand it when it when it becomes beautiful, I understand it coming back to what I what I know and beyond that at the same point. Like for me that flag, an emblem of the idea of crossroads, the classic narrative situation of meeting at a crossroads where it's which direction do you go? What position do you take? It's about confrontation of of maybe your polar opposite. Uh, it's the idea of do I go north, south, east, or west? And so I'm taking that theme and visually exploding it in this flag with this two situations coming into each other as color. Maybe in my my mind, the voices of the people in that neighborhood, in that community. And then this other oppositional force of silence or white space with a blue line going through it that was representative of the thin blue line of the police. This became uh, a catalyst for and an emblematic of what the entire project was about. When I was looking at Michael Brown initially for that project, it was five years out and I was reading all these articles that didn't really answer anything about what happened, but just showed different opinions and different conditions of truth out of that event. And it was slightly frustrating for me only because as I wanted to really get at a sense of what was what what is the truth hearing so many different reasonings that came out of newspapers and reporting and, and, and stories about it and information and, and witness eyewitness accounts of it. It was there justice? Is there justice in the way that people are bringing new information to the situation? Did it change the, out the outcome of the ruling? No, in the, a lot of cases, just a lot of confusion. So I wanted in that project to be able to create a situation through the two, two different institutions to have dialogue about that, about that killing, about that incident, to be able to create a situation where people can feel safe, to be able to speak about what they understand happened. And then when George Floyd and his murder came about, it made my project even more urgent because it, what when I when I was started the project, my project that in in St. Louis and Ferguson, I felt like maybe I'm just stirring up water that the neighbors don't want to stir up. Maybe I'm talking about something that's at the time five years old, is maybe an old issue, and we've gone past it. 
with when George Floyd came about and that incident happened, plus others up leading up to it, it 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 it, it put and it, particularly George Floyd, it put the world to notice. And I think maybe that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had COVID nineteen ongoing, that this world would not have paused enough to be able to look at this as closely as they did, to, to be able to create the protests around the world as they did because of this again and again and again reoccurring tragic relationship between black people and the police or authority and the abuse of power. So I feel like um, that's what that flag was doing. I feel um you know, that this work came at a time where it could take, you know, take part in the conversation that has happened because of all this stuff that's ongoing. And, you know, it makes me think about what this coronavirus pandemic is all about and in a sense of its historic nature. It's not it's not a war like World War One or World War Two. It's not like the Biafran War. But this has changed um, this has changed life forever. Coming back to the flags, I think that it's a moment that not only deals with its subject matter of Michael Brown, but it also took on everything else that was going worldwide, ongoing worldwide. You are one of the hardest working artists we know. How do you stay motivated to accomplish so much? Uh, sometimes I just don't know how, actually. Um, and I appreciate that, I guess. I've, I've never actually, I think people are starting to call me to my face, one of the hardest art work working artists they know, possibly because they're seeing all the different things that I have done and I am doing consecutively. I think for me, it all comes back to one thing, to trying to make a better and clearer understanding of my place in the world. And I'm realizing that understanding, part of it is that I'm sharing it. And so then it's to understand how to convey that uh, to clearly to others. Odili Donald Odita, from periphery to center, is on view in St. Louis, Missouri through December 20th. Mirror, an exhibition of new paintings, is on view at the Jack Shaneman Gallery in New York City through October 1st. And Negative Space, as part of the exhibition Color Field, will open at the University of Houston, Texas in October. Jonathan Lethem is the author of 12 novels, including Fortress of Solitude and Motherless Brooklyn, as well as several story and essay collections. His new novel, The Arrest, comes out in November. He once told me that his first residency at Yaddo made him feel like he had come in from the cold. I couldn't be more pleased that this literary hero among emerging writers found his way here. Listen as he explains why luck, why talisman, are so crucial. Have lucky things. It doesn't matter what they are. I bought a green cardigan sweater for a quarter at a thrift store in Bennington, Vermont, and wore it nearly every day through the writing of my first three novels until it was in tatters. Even then, I kept it in my closet and wore the tatters for selected moments as I wrote the next book or two. When I wrote The Fortress of Solitude, I had a fortune cookie taped onto the hood of my computer, a mysterious atypical fortune. I can't remember the exact words. Something like, you don't know the whole story. It encouraged me to go deeper in that book than I'd gone before, into my personal mysteries. Not to settle. While I was working on Chronic City, I ate the same kind of breakfast cereal, Barbara's shredded spoonfuls, with the same bowl and the same spoon. It had a kind of fluted handle I liked. Every morning, just like Wade Boggs eating chicken before every baseball game. The point isn't to believe in hokum, but to turn yourself over to the force of ritual, to deliver the project out of your own neurotic proprietorship. The physicist Niels Bohr kept a horseshoe over his doorway, and when he was challenged by a visitor as to whether he believed in such things, he replied, of course not but I am told it works even if you don't believe in it. Or the joke about the man who was searching for his lost keys on a darkened street. A policeman stopped to help him, 
and the man had the cop look with him under a street lamp. When the cop asked if this was where the man had lost the keys, the man said, No, but there's more light here. Always search where the light is. Yaddo was one of my lucky things. Thanks for listening to Shadow Yaddo. We thank our sponsors, including the Stewarts and Dake Family Gift, as well as the Yaddo artists who contributed to What is Yaddo, our sound collage. In order of appearance, they were Edgar Oliver, Laura Schwendinger, Dean Haspel, Sam Fader, and Michael Snedeker. And thank you, Joseph Keckler, for your adaptation of our theme music, Strangers from the Internet. Music by Yaddo Composers inspires global ovation, and we are grateful to the following artists who contributed music. Tarek O'Regan's Lines of Desire was performed by John Lenehan and is available on the album The Quiet Room on the Sony Classic label. Carol Lipnick was the first to respond to her query for music, thank you Carol, with her extraordinary song The Oyster in the Sand. And Anthony Gatto's The Making of American is a new opera based on the work of Gertrude Stein. On the way out, remember what I said about paradox and this moment for artists? Well, here's Rory Golden. I can't really talk about this, but I'll tell you, the toe sucker rolled through a third time in a week tonight. He pulls up in the old maroon SUV. I jump up on the running board with my right foot, grab the bar on top with my right hand, kick off my left shoe quick, already untied when I see him coming. We talked on the other corner. We're at the T now. I peel off my left sock and flip it on top of the car with my neckerchief mask, then shove my foot in the dude's face. He smells my foot and then tickles it, unbearable, lightly. The soles, just 30 seconds, maybe slowly, then quickly, the fingertips fast. Then he sucks each of my toes. The big one first wet. Oh, Jesus, God, my friend Mary Ellen McKechnie used to say. I squeal like a pig and goddamn vacuum on each toe. Let me be clear, this is not my thing. It's over fast and flat haired dude hands me my five and says thanks. And I limp up the way in one and a half shoes, my left foot wet, drying, little walk of shame, thinking I don't know what Yaddo is. Is is impossible, and so is Yaddo, and so the 1 a.m. $5 toe sucker. But they're real, they're all happening, all of them except is there and is. If you enjoy it, you understand it. If you enjoy it, you understand it. But I mean by understanding enjoyment. You mean by understanding that you can talk about it in the way that you have the habit of talking. Look here, what is a normal amount? Look here, what is a normal amount?